Aviation writer and plane and pilot consultant Tim Kern sat down with aviation legend <laughs> Pete Law. They talked about everything from Pete's time at the Lockheed Skunk Works to what he does here with the airplanes at Reno for ADI and carburation. Turbocharging, supercharging. I noticed that, uh, for instance, the Merlins are supercharged and not turbocharged. And I bet that over the last 60 or 70 years, somebody's figured out why. Well, the turbo superchargers that they were developing back in the 40s were required a lot of metals in them that we didn't have. And so we tried to minimize that. In fact, the turbos only went on, for instance, like a P-38, the B-17, some of the airplanes, the, um, the P-47, they only put them on a few because they just couldn't afford to put them on them all. They didn't have the nickel and the ankle inconel and the things that were required in the turbine blades to be able to handle the 1400 degree Fahrenheit or higher exhaust gases coming out of the engine. And the later model 3350s also had the turbocharging, but as a compact package, the, super, the mechanically driven supercharger worked well. They put clutches in it to shift it as they went up in altitude, they shifted to a different speed to make it go faster to give more compression because they wanted to be able to fly at high altitude and still have sea level takeoff power. Now a P-38 could have sea level takeoff power up as high as 30, up to 33,000 feet eventually. So they'd be fighting against airplanes that, that were not as equal in horsepower to them for the size of the airplane. And they had the turbo supercharger to pre-compress it, then it would go through the carburetor, then into the engine-driven compressor, and still then be able to see standard takeoff type numbers that's at 33,000 feet. Of course, the B-17s had to have that to get extra power, and uh, P-47s were also a very good fighter, and they were big enough to have a turbocharger on them. Now, turbocharged engines in the smaller classes is very, very easy to do because the turbos are small and they can build the airplane around them. We have these big old airplanes that we couldn't really put turbos into. Now, there was a plane named Mr. Awesome several years ago that raced, which had a turbocharged 3350. Actually, it wasn't turbocharged. What they did is they took the exhaust gases coming out, they expanded them through a turbine, and it went straight into the propeller shaft of the crankshaft, and they were called power recovery turbines. And they were on Connie airplanes and DC-7s with a power recovery turbine. They could put out 3,700 horsepower with a 3350 engine when they went to turbo compounding for takeoff power. Mm -hmm. Now, when you take a regular engine and you shift the, those blowers, for instance, the Merlin has a two-stage, two sets of superchargers, two stages, and they have two speeds. And, a, and, and the Allison only had a uh, one-stage uh, supercharger, but they had the turbo, which sort of acted as a pre-stage. So they used the turbo as the pre-stage, and the, and the, uh, and the engine-driven one is the second stage. And they were able to do just about as good as the, uh, as the Merlins and the uh, do you see uh, piston engines have been around an awfully long time and most of the engines that we see here in the big classes, in the unlimited classes, these engines were designed in the 30s and the 40s. And do you see anything on the horizon that's going to replace these engines? Or is there going to be a continued development in the same kind of a footprint? Well, I think eventually the super sport class is going to take over because pretty soon these airplanes are going to be too rare for people to... Uh, try to make go faster. Although it is nice to hear the big noisy engines go roaring around, you'll never be able to build engines like piston engines like they did back in the old days because the people who knew how to do that and all the little secrets have all passed on and have not left their secrets with anybody that's still alive. I managed to glean what I gleaned from people who had worked on the engines before and they have since passed away also. And I think that the uh, future of air racing is going to be uh, the 1,000 horsepower or TSIO, for instance, 720s and some of the Trace engine, the Orenda engines, the, the Thunder Mustang engines, the uh, Falconer. Uh, 
uh, Fa Fry Ryan Falconer's, uh, what, I can't remember the name of his engine. But, it, well, uh, it's just a 650. It's, uh, yeah. He runs that engine in many configurations, of course, in boats and so on, yes. well over 1,000 horsepower. Yes, and that's that's what the future is going to be. You make a small... boats don't have emergency landing problems. Yeah, that's that's true. They just sort of drift and stop. <laughs> but uh, they're, they're, unless somebody's going to spend some really big bucks, you're never going to be building piston engines that are the size of what we have right now. And that's why they're as a big attraction for them is because there will be nothing bigger and the people like the noise and I like the work on piston engines. I'm not a jet guy as far as as far as engines go to work on the engines but I love to be able to design Mach 3.2 airplanes and Mach 3.5 airplanes and a few other things that'll go faster but that's in a whole different uh, era. I mean a whole different do that with pistons. No we won't do that with pistons at all. I know people have tried but uh, the pistons don't get you supersonic. Unless you're in, not even in a dive, but uh, and I, I'm wondering also uh, a lot of a lot of things that used to be thought of as the hot setup kind of came and went. Sometimes that's because of metallurgical uh, developments. Sometimes it's because of fuel. Uh, sometimes it's because people found out that everything they thought they knew was wrong. And I'm wondering if any of those have tripped your your memory in a particular way. Well, no, I, I I know that I've been through so many things that they're all clogged up back there in the in the computer storage that are inaccessible instantly anymore. Now, I, if you have some examples, ask me, and I can probably remember a few. Well, some of them had to do, of course, with uh, with water injection in the early days, uh, with the spray bars, with the idea of actually putting liquid uh, against the metal on the outside. Uh, which, of course, the, the liquid never actually gets to the metal if the metal's hot enough. It simply removes the calories from the air, and then the air does its cooling job. You know, the Germans, back when they were doing their speed record back in 1939, they took the boiling cooling system like I'm trying to use, and they recondensed the steam by using the surfaces of the airplane and the wings and recondensed it and had a recirculating system but it was very poor. Now the Maki Castalli MC-72 which holds the world's land, uh, water sea, sea plane, okay. sea planes uh, record, it's uh, 444 miles an hour and it was done back in, 19, in the 1940s by the Italians and their pontoons on their airplane and their wings were the surface cooling. They would circulate the coolant through those. And they didn't worry about recovering it. They actually used the, the surfaces as the heat exchanger surface. And they had a two-engined airplane where one of the engines drove its crankshaft through the V of the other engine, which drove a counter-rotating prop in one direction, and the front engine drove the counter-rotating prop in the other direction. And that airplane is in a museum in Italy, and it still holds the seaplane world speed record. But those are the kinds of things you can do with surface cooling. Now, I don't go into the surface cooling part of it because f heat transfer is a function of friction. The higher the friction, the higher the heat transfer. But aha, the higher the friction, the higher the drag. You kind of keep the air surfaces smooth. That means you'd have to have larger surfaces. And it's easy just to boil the fluid and dump it overboard. That's why we had most of these. Now, I've worked on Daryl Greenemeyer's airplane had the water boiling oil cooling system. And then we had one that was called Mr. Awesome, which also had the water boiling oil cooling system. That plane was uh, the turbo compounded R3350 with the turbos that, that actually put power back into the shaft rather than just supercharge it. And then there was an airplane that was a P-51 called Stiletto that Matt Jackson flew, and the only thing that air that was taken on board for was to run the engine. All the oil cooling and all the coolant cooling were all done with the water boil boiling oil cooling system. Now, Jimmy Leeward has, is converting the Galloping Ghost that he had as uh, Spectre and uh, Leeward Air Ranch Special here that used to be Genie, which used to be Candace that we designed. He right now is testing his water boiling, complete uh, boiled cooling system down in Minden, and he didn't make it up here to Reno because he didn't have time to get it all perfected. But he's working on doing one of those. Voodoo wants to go to a complete water boiling oil and coolant cooling system, and it adds about 30 to 40 miles an hour to the airplane. So we have done that. And then, of course, Michael Brown in September Fury had the cooling oil cooling system, which will boil the coolant. And right now we're getting it into the Bearcat, and we're just having a few teething problems.